Well, I, for one, am looking forward to the next 45 minutes. I think Brother Len and Brother Mark might have scratched their head when they got this and said, why me? Uh, they're going to have a dialogue about proper respect for leaders. Committee for the subject that they have chosen for. Yeah, Brother Carl used to say, why not me? So, so let me see. Got it. So we'll do the best. See can. again so. if we can get a screenshot up, but uh, hmm. well, I'll, I'll kind of introduce our subject to us. What we're talking about when when they gave us this subject was proper respect for leaders. Of course, one would say um, we're talking about what is the respect for our elders and deacons in the ecclesia? Is that what they're re referring to? Uh, that is not the subject that we're discussing. This afternoon was talking about proper respect. Thank you, Brother Land. You're welcome. For those in power, the princes of this earth, the kings, those that are um, overruling our affairs, living in this society, you know, as citizens, uh, what responsibilities we have, what re what type of respect do we is ex is expected of us? to uh, live in this in this world you know and so i took what it lends slides from a presentation he did a while back on uh and one of the scriptures he mentions is, is ephesians 2 19 from the international version it says you are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of god's household but we're members of god's household so uh, how does that relate to what is our responsibility to be about the this the, the world now that we are living in in that household? What responsibilities do we have? What proper respect? So we're trying to uh, going to kind of re reflect our discussion around that today. Now I was promised that this was going to be a fireside chat, but I don't see a fire. It's, it says dialogue. Oh, okay. I somehow so, misread it. But yeah, well, I mean, do you have any opening thoughts? That's right, like, dialogue. Well, I think. You know, you can look at this scripture, uh, at this subject, in a lot of different ways. It's true. We have a whole lot of things written about, you know, honor and respect within the ecclesia. But it's clear when the scriptures you see on your program, uh, and we see on the program that we're talking in Romans 13, especially, it's getting into the subject of uh, every person is to be sub uh, in subjection to the governing authorities and no authority except from God. Well, that's a very interesting one. Uh, and we'll get in, I think, you know, get into a little bit more on that, Mark, because, uh, you know, there's some that will say, yeah, 1914 ended the Gentile times were no longer, you know, the God is no longer paying attention. Uh, my response has been, well, why don't you stop paying your taxes and see what happens right. if they're no right. longer in authority? And we'll talk a little bit about taxes. I think you know, that was really what drove a lot of this because when Jesus, what they were trying to trap Jesus in Matthew, uh, he ends up saying, you know, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So the question becomes what things are Caesar's? Uh, not everything, certainly. So it's an interesting question. I think that Ephesians 1 is meant to sort of be the over in my mind, the overruling thing, it says, you know, we have to keep in mind that this is, it's not a place we're trying to preserve. We know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Our citizenship, primary citizenship is in heaven, but yet we are citizens of the earth and all of us that work, I think certainly you have to know that there's responsibilities you have. So where does that go? Um, one of the things interesting is when it says, uh, well, maybe we should read that. Yeah, well, I said 13.1, uh, yeah, that, if you want I can, to do that. The, uh, the committee gave us three scriptures to look at that they wanted us to address. Romans 13, one through seven, 1 Timothy 2, one through four, and 2 Timothy 2, three and four. And so I'll go ahead and read just the first section in Romans. And then we'll go and move on to the next scriptures and we'll, we'll try to focus on this for a bit. So it says in Romans, starting Romans 13, one, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, uh, except for, 
Well, I'm going to lose it there. My screen is getting covered up, so I'll read from here. Um, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whosoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So that's our first set of scriptures to look at. And I, I can go all the way back to Abraham's day to look how he looked on this, uh, on what responsibilities do you have. So I'm just going to, uh, the screen is not advanced. Well, it, it looks like it's advanced, but it's covered up on this end. So I'm going to- Okay, that's not up there. I think it's so. Bad. And I just put it in, in the blackout okay. mode, so that's fine. Yeah, we got that. But, you know, when you think back in Abraham's day, when Lot was captured by the armies of, as it's referred to as uh, uh, Shedelamar, if I pronounce it right. And those forces uh, took Lot and, and, and uh, uh, those who were associated with him into captivity. And what did Abraham do? He took, he took uh, his tribe and went up and, and, and uh, fought against Shedelamar and those forces and uh, recovered Lot and brought him back down. Well, who met them? when they were coming back down uh, where they were residing, the king of Sodom. And what did Sodom tell uh, Abraham, asked him to do? You take, uh, give us back all the people, but you take all the spoils. And what was Abraham's response? Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latcheth, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. And so when you take that concept of thinking, if we get ourselves involved in worldly matters and, and relying on the governments to provide us uh, our needs and cares and our wants and, and our uh, fulfilling all those needs, and uh, then, as Abraham says, I don't want to have anything. I don't want to be associated with that at all. I, I'm looking, what was the scripture? In Hebrews 11, 9, it says, By faith you sojourned in the land of promise in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So when you put it in that respect, Abraham didn't want anything to do with the worldly governments and have any have to rely on them for his welfare. So that's a, that's kind of the interest to do. But when you read this scripture in the opening verse of Romans 8, when every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So how do we answer that, Brother Lynn? Well, <laughs> When we look at um, authority, what does it mean to submit to authority? No, I don't think anyone would, anyone would disagree. There is authority in the earth, and we have to we have to obey that. To me, uh, depending on where you live in the world, uh, authority is, it has a different connotation to you. If you live under a dictator, that's authority. That's you know. Uh, dictated if you live in a country where like here in America where it's you have more freedom 
it's supposed to be that the government serves the people, not the other way around. Uh, but so I think we have to look at it from a perspective of where we are specifically and those that are outside this area may have a little different view. So I, I think I, at least I'd like to address it from the standpoint of where most of us are and listening to this convention, it's really, we're talking about uh, North America, USA, Canada. But I, I sort of put together a list of, I think, what are uh, things that are the laws that we must obey, things of authority that we're looking at and what I would focus on. Uh, one is to obey the laws. Two is to, uh, if called, serve jury duty. That's a requirement uh, to serve as a witness and uh, to register for the draft as we had here. Those are things that are, man there's mandatory things. Those are mandatory things. There are also voluntary things. Uh, one of the voluntary things is voting. Uh, you're not required to vote. Some countries you are, and you know they want 99% ballot. So I think there's where we need to differentiate. Some agree uh, with voluntary things. Some don't do voluntary things. But the things of obeying the laws uh, and things, I think those are the things we have to work on. We have to obey. Let me just take one example. Okay, paying taxes. Uh, paying taxes is something that, um, well, it is voluntary in a way because you make out your own taxes here. But let's take, for example, what do you do if you feel a tax is unjust? Uh, back in the 60s, 1963, there was a movement started called the Peacemakers Movement. It was during the time of Vietnam. And the peacemakers said you know, they wanted to not pay the amount of taxes that were going towards the war effort. About 1964, 65, some of you may remember a folk singer named Joan Baez. Uh, she decided she was going to withhold 60% of her taxes that went to the war and signed up a lot of people to do it with this peacemaker group. Uh, there was then in 68, a specific tax that was passed to fund the war in Vietnam. And that tax was 10%. And it was a surtax put on between 68 and 69, but that 10% was a war tax. Some people objected to paying that tax, withheld it. When I was, I was a CEO from 70 to 72, and some of the guys that were there as CEOs uh, they talked about the fact that they had withheld this 10% put in account they weren't going to fund the war. Is that as far as we should go? Should we go to that extent? It says submit to the authorities, but what if the authority conflicts? What if that law conflicts with our personal beliefs? Now, we have a provision under the, uh, under the selective service that we have an option. Do we have an option for the other things? And if we don't, what do you think? Is it okay for us to withhold? Well, you, back in the 60s, they might have had a separate tax for the war effort. I think the government leaders have gotten a lot wiser in how they propose taxes now, and most of these things are funded out of their general obligations. They don't necessarily pick a specific tax. I could see how, if there was a war tax, how for conscience sake, you could say, well, I'm not gonna pay that part and set it aside. Yeah. I don't, I would, I would probably suggest they would be uh, less likely to do that. Uh, and so they find ways to work around that. But paying, not paying your taxes can find you quickly, uh, find yourself with the authorities coming against you, where you could be thrown in jail for not paying taxes. But I can understand for conscience sake, when you look at that from at that perspective, what are we obligated to do? And our Lord's answer was the simplest, as you pointed out earlier, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So if we look at it from that perspective and then render unto God what is God, and when they conflict, then, then you have to understand, well, I may have to disobey the laws of the land. Now, we live in a, you mentioned we live in a society here in the West 
in the West is uh, pretty comfortable to live in. Most of the laws that they pass are generally designed to for comfort us. They aren't designed to be that aggressive and try to uh, throw us in jail for not obeying what the leader uh, has done. But go back to uh, go back to uh, uh, the days of uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What what happened to those? So, in that case, there was a edict announced that uh, uh, they were to bow down and worship the image of the uh, of uh, was it the Mead? Darius the Mead was, a, it was I think is what it was. And if they refused, they'd be thrown in jail. Well, not just jail, but they were. They were uh, uh, thrown into a fiery furnace. And of course, they were uh, preserved by God. They were willing to sacrifice their life. If God was going to save them, he would save them. But it, they were not going to, for conscience sake, violate God's laws and, and uh, bow down and worship an image. And the same thing for Daniel. Uh, he was, the edict was passed that uh, there was, they were, not to pray to any other god for 30 days other than to caesar in that respect and if they were violated if they violated that law then they would be thrown into the lion's den and of course that's where daniel found himself and he and uh, the graciousness of god he overruled the overruled it and daniel was saved out of it so we can take it back we can take it into the new testament and we can look at some of the things that occurred during the times, let's say Nero and Caligula, and what they told the Christians that they could do and not do, we can discuss that. Well, I'll let you have a few yeah. comments here, Brother Lynch. I think uh, when we think about this first scripture in Romans 13, it says submit to the authorities because they're from God. That's an ideal, that authority should represent what is justice and fair. And I, I listed about five, six things that I think a, a leader, at least ones that are put there for authority should do. And these are ideals to create justice, to protect the good, uh, to be servants, uh, to be uh, mediators of the structure of society, to administer justice and punish evil. Now, and many times it's gone beyond it, but that's the ideal. And I think those are the principles If we look through some of the Old Testament scriptures. Those were principles that were put down for those that were in authority. And so from that standpoint, you know, subjecting authority under those principles is what we should do. You know, we should be the ideal uh, citizen in the sense of obeying the laws and doing them. Now, uh, it's not always true that that happens today, but I think that's really where our initiative to lie. We're not there to, to bring a big cause to society. At one time in my life, I thought, you know, it was our job to change the world. We know that's not true. God is going to change the world. We're going to change the world if we are uh, successful in our walk in the, in the narrow way. So it's not the time. So I think to the extent possible, again, like we said, uh, when submission to authority means that you're obeying the laws of the land and you're not creating some big cause uh, because of what's going on, uh, that's not our role. That's not our job at this point. At least that's, uh, that's what I feel. And that's what, really what I think it means to Romans 13, 1, when it says to submit yourself to the authority. That's when I think Jesus said, you render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He didn't say give everything to Caesar, but he did differentiate between things that are part of the earthly responsibilities and things that are part of the others. He never ventured on a cause to, to overthrow the government, which is what they wanted. So I think we should do the same. We should have respect for those in authority, even though we do not necessarily think they are the best of people. And that's going to happen to us. Uh, I think there is a danger in our day. And I see it, I see it amongst the brethren that there's division. 
going over political issues sure. and political people. And I think that's a danger. It's a tool Satan's using to divide us. And we have to really watch that end of it. We have to watch in fact, this is not what we're about. We're about a cohesiveness around God's law and God's rule. And um, yes, we have to pay attention. I mean, I, I admit, I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the world as much as the next person, but don't get yourself allied on one side or the other. And that's, that's where the issue lies, I think. Jesus said that we should stay separate and that, that we should uh, you know, really focus on rendering to God what's God's and giving what we need to the world. So, Well, you know, we can spend all of our time, as you point out, focusing our lives around politics if you wanted to. And you can be on the left side or the right side of, of issues or backing left side or right side of, uh, of a political persuasion. And, uh, you know, some... Uh, some, well, the general population and percentage of the gets so involved in that, and then if their candidate doesn't uh, come <laughs> come out ahead at the end, you know, then they just uh, they they uh, denigrate down the other leaders that are in in, in office at the time. But you know, we, I was trying to focus a little bit on you know we think our leaders are uh, the current leaders that we have in governance are there for to help us out. I. I there was a comment that Brother Russell had a while back, how well things were going back in his day, uh, how well the government was doing and looking out for the, the betterment of the people in this country. And do we think it is still true today? And, uh, and there's probably differences of opinion of that. Maybe yes, maybe not. But does this give us reason to defy what God has granted? Because uh, we know the scriptures that tell us that it's God that has put these uh, institutions in power for a period of time. Uh, and so we're obligated to buy, obey the, the lawful laws of the society. We don't want to come up against them and create insurrection. That is not, not what we're about. But what happened to the apostle, apostles in the day when, uh, uh, and I'll quote you a scripture in Acts uh, 415 where it was talking about the advice is the same as Paul's but it is this ring that when Peter and John were commanded not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus can you imagine that what if what if a law was passed today that Christians couldn't speak about Jesus you would certainly for conscience sake not uh, uh, follow that law and you might be thrown in jail over doing that if you did. And that seems, uh, uh, that seems to be an obligation that we have as Christians, who are we following? And uh, is, so when the laws of the state don't conflict with the laws of God and our teachings and the gospel message, then I can see we can live in, live in unity or in a calm way together. But when they do violate each other, uh, it's not that we go out and protest on the streets. What did what what, what did they do when Paul was thrown in jail, and or when and when the other just, uh, apostles were thrown in jail and the gates were open? They where where did they go? They went to the temple to preach. Yeah. They didn't go out and protest in the streets. It doesn't mean we engage in some big social revolution. I think we all understand that. But it doesn't mean blind obedience either. And that's really what we have to think about. Uh, we have to be able to sort out what things are principles behind scripture and behind what we're following and what are not. And I, I think about brethren in other countries, Romania, you've all read some of the things that happened in Romania under Ceausescu, and we've got a number of people here that... Uh, had to experience that. You know, you've got some very tough decisions there, and many of them did go to prison because they refused to submit to think unjust laws that they thought. So that's, we've had the privilege here of not really having to do that. Uh, we can complain a lot and we're not arrested. Right. Uh, 
uh, there that wasn't always true. So again, a lot depends on the framework of where you are living. But I, I would like to look at the next verses, though, the next scriptures, the second Timothy or first Timothy, because that's got an interesting statement in first Timothy, uh, where he says, first of all, then I urge you to offer to God petitions, prayers, intercessions, and expressions of thanks for all people, for kings, and for everyone who has authority, so that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life with all godliness and dignity. Now, there is a qualification there, but it's interesting when you look at that verse, it says, for everyone who has authority, for kings, uh, so if you're in Ukraine, do you pray for Zelensky? Or if you're in Russia, do you pray for Putin? Well, I don't think it's talking about praying for individuals. Jesus never said, pray for Caesar. Or pray for, Paul never said, you know, pray for Nero. But it was a point was here that we could lead the kind of life that we need to live. We need to live as a Christian. And as a follower of Jesus. So I think that's, uh, that's really where our prayers are. You know, God preserves the world. Right? Because why? Why is he preserving the world? Well, I'll talk more about that on Thursday. But, but I think we have to say it's because the church is not complete. You know, once that happens, then God is going to, I think, push the kingdom in as soon as possible. Uh, but that's the whole point is uh, we're praying that we can operate as a Christian and exercise our conscience under the current situation that we're in. So when I see that scripture in 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, I think we do have to qualify it with the second part. We pray not for the individual, but we pray for uh we pray for those in authority might allow us to live as we are. Uh, in Paul's life, you're right, Mark, Paul's life, Nero, <laughs> he was talking about Nero. Was Paul saying, pray for Nero? Well, he was one of the most corrupt people, uh, emperors ever. Uh, but again, I think Jesus didn't pray for Caesar, Pilate, uh, Herod, and the Lord's Prayer, when we have, has no reference to individually even into the world's organization. It's all about God's organization. So what are we to pray for? I think we're to pray for uh, the opportunity to live the life that we feel we should live. And we pray that the authorities might exercise uh, according to that, those principles so that we can live that way. Yeah, I, I was thinking of that same uh, thought. You know, we have our Lord's answer to uh, should... Uh, how should we be, you know, it says here in, in, in verse two, uh, you're, to give uh, uh, petitions and prayers and intercessions uh, for kings, or when you think of our leaders of today, and what did Jesus have to say about this in, in his day? Uh, and he says, it's recorded in Matthew 5, 43, you have heard that it is, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what he said initially. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and, unto, and, un, and on the unrighteous also. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So, you know, when you think about praying uh, uh, for those that persecute you or despitefully, despitefully use you, we're, we are indeed hoping for God's kingdom to be set up when mankind will learn righteous and we certainly pray that we will live a peaceable life. I think that's key. Yeah. And that, uh, that God will allow us to live and to fellowship with our dear brethren under the arrangements of society. 
But we know back in World War II uh, and now in Ukraine, you look, think of think how many brethren were in prison during World War II or even World War I because they were uh, conscientious objectors and they weren't given that option of not entering into uh, uh, becoming a soldier in the military. So this is something to think about. We live in a relatively peaceful time, but, you know, just recently, what do they have? 3,000 or 5,000? 5, 5, 5, they just called up zero. the reserves. Yeah. So we don't know how soon they might want to introduce a draft. So we had a nice session with a, a CEO's meeting the other discussing all of these issues uh, and what the young brethren should be thinking about during this present time. So I think, Mark, we, you know, we pray for their overruling of the Gentile powers uh, to accomplish God's purpose. The rulers are there until I said, until I think the full end of the Gentile times. Uh, and the powers are limited by God. And we're just in harmony with that prayer. Psalm 76, 10 says, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. To me, that's saying God is going to let the things that man does uh, praise him by accomplishing his task, but let them only go so far. Uh, for example, we're, we're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But yet we know Ezekiel 38 says they're going to get attacked. Uh, that's not peace. But I think that's the example of praying for the overruling. Let me give an example. Uh, there's an example from World War I that I like, uh, 1914. Uh, it happened August 1st. At that time, we know, even in Brother Russell's day, that the leading Jews were pressing an interest in what was then Palestine. Uh, Turkey was in control of that land at the time, and they, they had to be expelled. So in 1917, remember what happened? Allenby drove out the Turks and took possession of Jerusalem. Well, a month later, uh, the British signed the Balfour Declaration at the League of Nations that reestablished Palestine for the Jews. But there's an interesting twist on that. Why did Balfour sign the declaration at the League of Nations? The representative from Great Britain was a guy named Lord Curzon, and he actually opposed the Jewish resettlement. Uh, just prior to the vote that was to be taken, he became violently ill. Balfour was selected to take his place. Balfour had been the original sponsor of the declaration, but he was not to vote on it. But now he was put in that place. The confirmation was passed. Britain was appointed as the administrator of Palestine, and you know then what happened. So I think that's an example of God overrules the rulers. And so when we pray, we pray that God overrules things to accomplish his will and accomplish his tasks. And I think that's a good example of what it is. So what do we pray for? If we're to pray for leaders, we pray that, you know, those that are in authority will be overruled of anything they try to do that, you know, is, goes against God's uh, plans and purposes. And especially this case for Israel, you know, that was a big part of it. So just an example of when we get this, and the second part of that, as I said, is key, uh, so that we can lead the kind of life and godliness and dignity that we want to. So, well, we just have a few minutes left. Maybe we can go to our yeah. third scripture. Okay. And that is found in 2 Timothy 2, verses 2 and 3 for context. It says, there suffer hardship with me as a good soldier in uh, Christ, of Christ Jesus. Uh, no... Um, no soldier in an act of service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So when you think about this, as a, when a soldier goes into the Army or the Navy, I can tell you about that, you are obligated for all that you do as part of that unit. I mean, your life is now dependent on that, and uh, uh, you're, you have to obey the lawful commands of your uh, of, of those who are who are over you the officers that are over you 
and so we have to put this in, in, in the context of what does it mean to be a good soldier in Christ Jesus? And what should we be doing? We should we be actively going outside of what our Lord has asked us to do, spreading the gospel? Should we spend our time getting in politics? Should we spend a lot of time? Oh, you can take it to any level from national office to state government to local townships to schools. Take it down to the school level. And, and how much should we get involved when it affects our children? And a lot of brethren can understand that you might have children in, in elementary school or high school, and they're trying to they're trying to in, they're trying to institute things that we think would be so corrupt uh, that they're trying to fill the our children's minds with. Are we obligated to stand up against that? How how should we look at that? Oh, that's a good point. Uh, I don't think we're to stand idle and not represent righteousness. I think we need to do that. But there is a lesson we have to take in, uh, you know, how far do we go and how much time do we invest? There is injustice. And I, let me give you, I think the best way for me to give it is, I want to give six guidelines that I look at as that scripture that talks about us being ambassadors for Christ. Because <laughs> that's about our citizenship. We're, Jesus says we're ambassadors. Or Paul says we're ambassadors, and an ambassador you know, is someone that works in a foreign country but represents the ideals of the, the host country. Number one, personal integrity. Number two, an alertness to the problems and the dignity of individuals. Number three, objectivity. Number four, independence. Number five, the development of others. And number six, to have an interest in the major problems of the day. Brother Carl Hagen used to have a saying that says, sometimes we're so spiritually minded that we're no earthly good. <laughs> and I think that can, be, that can be true. We can have our heads, but we have to recognize that there are certain issues. And to the extent, I think that we can aid in the dignity of individuals. At uh, one time before I, before uh, I did my selective service and before really, uh, before I thought a lot about uh, what I wanted to do with my life, uh, my last year of college, I signed up for the Peace Corps. Well, then the selective service came with the lottery and that kind of took care of it because my number was 29. Uh, but, you know, I, I you have this desire, and I think everybody does. We're here because we have a desire to change the world. But you learn that that's not where we are today. But we can change the world of one individual, one at a time. And I think we have, do have a duty to do that to the extent possible. Gretchen and I, when we were younger, uh, we took foster kids in because we could, felt we could help them. We didn't want our daughter to be raised alone. The Lord blessed that effort. I think there's others that you know, align themselves because they see injustice against certain individuals. I think we shouldn't be criticizing that. Uh, that's an opportunity we have, but we can't, it's not our job now to sort of to change society. Mm -hmm. We cannot do that, but we can speak out against unjust and injustice. So that's where I go. And I think uh, that's why I say uh, helping individuals uh, that is something we can do and I, I personally think we should do that involvement is more important to me than joining in a cause or sitting on a uh, place where you're one voice amongst many and I don't criticize people brother for doing that but I think that's the problem we have we need to be able to speak out for righteousness on an individual basis well, I like your thought about it, the individual, individuality that, and I know our chairman is here, so I'm just going to have a closing scripture so, so he understands where we're going. But it, our individuality and having that personal effect we can with others, we aren't going to change this world. We, we know God has a plan and to, to have it come about. But he tells us, Jesus tells us, let your light shine before people 
in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If that is the essential theme of all that we do, and others can witness and see that in our lives, then we are having the proper effect, I think, that we should be having. We know we're praying for God's kingdom when mankind will learn righteousness, and we pray for that day. But we understand that he has that plan and it will unfold just as he has designed it. And we hope that we have a part in that plan of blessing all the families of the earth and the kingdom. Yeah, Mark, just one last thing I'd say. The application of truth in our lives and our actions should never be thoughtless and it should never be heartless. I think those are dangers that we can face. And we have to combat those kinds of things. Thank you, Brother Lamb. Myron, I, I thought we were going to get five extra minutes. Oh, because <laughs> he got his phone. You got your phone. <laughs>